It's January 21st, 2021. This is Rook. The New York Times deemed her the new face of Italian cinema in the early 2000s, and she has become a favorite in art house film. But Maya Sansa actually has an Iranian father and has in recent years been connecting to her Persian roots. The award-winning actress Maya Sansa joins me later in the show. But first, Iran, Iranians, and the new Biden administration. Barbara Slavin, an expert in U.S.-Iran relations and a director at the Atlantic Council, joins us on opportunities for change with a new team in the White House. Plus, Chef Haas is here with hospitality and Kian Nadami with It's All Persian to Us. This is conversations from, to, and about the Iranian diaspora. I'm Gian Gomeshi. This is Rook. Hi there, welcome to episode number 78 of Rook. Hope you are keeping well wherever you are tuning in from around the world. We are on this ongoing mission to build a new audiovisual encyclopedia of Iranian diaspora identity. We're coming to you on our platforms SoundCloud, Spotify, uh, Instagram, as well as YouTube, iTunes, and Telegram. Hello, Guvi Shaya. Hello, Zianzu. How are you? Khoub, merci. Captain Reza. Hello, sir. The fabulous Kian is here. Hello. Salam. Zianzu. Salam. Mizuni. <laughs> uh, you guys, anybody watch any of the inauguration yesterday? Yeah, I did. Yeah. You didn't. Did uh, you? I did. Oh, I you did. did. It was. Oh, did. Uh, I mean, there was a lot of celebrities, and I don't remember it being like uh, you know, Lady Gaga was singing, Jennifer Lopez. Was it? A, was were inaugurations always this way? Absolutely. Okay, I guess yeah. I, I haven't watched enough to know. What do you mean? Did they have people performing? Yeah, it's like yeah, a that, Bill Clinton had LL Cool J. No, <laughs> they, they they did. I, you know, as a Canadian who does not have any direct interest in U.S. policies, I want to say I found it really inspiring. I mean. You know, whatever happens in America kind of does affect the world. So I'm just happy that the U.S. is already back in the Paris Climate Accord. Uh, sorry, Keon. And uh, <laughs> that there's an end of the offensive Muslim ban. Sorry, Keon. That prevented uh, so many Iranians from entering the States. To make it clear, I don't support those things. <laughs> but one you. thing I do not think was the best idea was uh, the JCPOA deal. So we'll oh, see. I mean, well, let's see okay. what comes out of that. That's not what we're going to talk about that coming up. But, you know, uh, anyway, beyond the policies, what I actually found uh, super inspiring why well, involuntarily I found myself emotional was these performances that you've referenced you know I am not really a Lady Gaga fan mm. I've always found her to be kind of too prefabricated it's too self-conscious the whole gig you know I don't she seems very nice I met her once she was lovely she's very very talented yes. but it just doesn't really work for mm. me and my favorite song ever is not the Star Spangled Banner I mean it's fine it's a nice anthem but but somehow Lady Gaga singing the American National Anthem, I was in tears. I was ah, literally moved right. so much by this. And then Jennifer Lopez singing America the Beautiful, first of all, I mean, she sounded great, which was kind of a surprise to me. I mean, we've known J-Lo for the last 50 years, but this, <laughs> it was like, well, that voice, wow. And it was just so gratifying so many times now in these big events, right? The Super Bowl halftime show or some big, you know, uh, concert event or something. Even last night when they were doing the America Celebrates, a lot of the artists were lip syncing. They had pre-recorded mm. it and then they were, mm. you know, miming it as they so they can look good and so the sound could be good. It was so gratifying that Lady Gaga and Jennifer Lopez and Garth Brooks were, were live. Love, that that, yeah. that was live singing. Even I think actually Gaga at one point was a little pitchy, yeah. which is which wasn't a problem because that's real and it just was so it was so moving and I I really enjoyed those, you know. Yes, actually, I, I, I just watched the highlights and uh, 
Lady Gaga for me was the highlights of the highlights, mm-hmm. you know. And I felt emotional. I'm not. I'm. Mm. I don't have any tie to American. That's but right. Yeah, but it was moving. Yes. Did now you? You are a Lady Gaga fan, right? Actually, yes. Unlike you, I, I am. Yeah, I, I yeah. like Lady Gaga. Yeah. My, you know what my problem with her is? Uh, I. I would it all like goes to know. back to Bowie. Oh, oh. Yeah. why? Everything leads back to Bowie. What? How? Because I they're feel... They're not comparable at all. Exactly. They're not comparable. Yeah, so So why? she should stop trying to be Bowie. Oh. <laughs> you know, like uh, she's... She's I mean, trying like, to be Bowie. Well, <laughs> I, I don't know. <laughs> I think she is. I think she was very inspired by it. But first of all, there was actually one occasion where, I think it was a tribute, where she did actually try and be Bowie. She dressed up and was doing a Bowie song and it was like, hang on, <laughs> slow down, no one cover Bowie, ever, please, right? But, um, but no, I mean, it, it, it was his gig 40 years earlier to say you should be unique I'm gonna be I'm gonna dress up on all these I just feel like mm. you know Lady Gaga is doing her version of Bowie I mean that really I'm just it's really a stupid reason to not like Lady Gaga her music has never particularly spoken to me but but uh, so I'm being cheeky but I also think she's trying to be Bowie. In it. I just find her art a little satanic, so I'm not a fan of that. <laughs> satanic? That's, yeah, just, just the no. way, like that meat dress a few years ago, that was weird. It was inventive. Yeah, it was oh, disgusting. sister, we'll pray for her this <laughs> Sunday service. But you know what the highlight for me was? was Bernie Sanders mittens. Yes. That was my highlight. The Bernie Sanders <laughs> meme. meme yeah. It's the best. So it's, it's the best. Uh, speaking of um, septuagenarians, happy birthday to Bahman Farmanara, oh, the yeah. I, iconic filmmaker, your friend, Shia, yeah, back in Iran. Yes, yes, actually. And, and he just released a book called The Memories of the First 75 Years. And I, and I thought he is going to turn to 75, but I just checked. Oh. And and he's turning to 79. Yeah, well, yes. uh, you know, Batman Farmanara was on our episode 12, yeah. uh, one of our first episodes. And it's still one of my favorite interviews we've done. He was very outspoken about censorship in Iran, even though he is in Tehran and was in Tehran whilst doing the interview. Um, I really, really... Uh, he's quite funny too he's got that dry sense of humor mm-hmm. um, he, you know if you don't know Batman Farmanara he's he, it, it is more art house kind of fair a lot of his films but um, he is uh, supremely talented and he's chosen to go back to Iran and live there yes. despite being very outspoken about uh, the government there and certainly about uh, censorship and being banned and all of that um, speaking of interviews I really liked uh on Monday, we had uh, Fadid Shafi Nuri on the show. The Texan kid, born and raised in Corpus Christi, t- Texas. Uh, he's an American guy who has thrown himself into classical Persian music and culture. Um, went to Iran, he learned the language, learned to sing Radif, teach Radif, plays the sitar. Um, it was uh, that episode, you know what I found really interesting is um, a lot of people don't know him. You know, he's kind of a newer name on the circuit, I guess, or whatever. But uh, but a lot of musicians, Iranian musicians, do know him. Because I was hearing from people, uh, mus- and they were musicians, going, I love that interview. Oh, I really liked hearing Farid. And I thought, you can always tell the really talented people because the people who do the same craft all know him, right? So I, I, I think that's probably true of Farid. Yes, yes. He is really talented. And... I think we are going to listen of him a lot in the next few years. And speaking of talented young people, we're going to hear a lot of in the in the next few years. Uh, one week ago today, we had After Hill on, mm. the young uh, Torontonian hip hop artist, uh, Iranian Canadian. Uh, he just released his first album, Tehranto. This guy is going to make big waves. Listen, you heard him here first. If you didn't hear him here first, go listen to that episode from a week ago, episode, I guess, 76, uh, After Hill. Um, really interesting guy. Great new record. And I could already see it's percolating in social media. People are starting to yeah. talk about it. Hip hop, big, big hip hop names are noticing it, you know. So. He's a great producer, not even, yeah. not even you know, rapper. Because I respect to those rapper who produce their own music, mm. you know. You know what I don't like about him, though, mm. uh. satanic. <laughs> <laughs> Is that the he's, meat? He's quite the opposite. Uh, he was wearing a <laughs> trousers that were covered in meat. No, no, he's quite Covering the opposite fair. of that. <laughs> Coming up on our show, Maya Sansa will join us from Paris. Uh, she lives in France now, 
big star in Italy and actually much of Europe. Very prolific. Like her, her pace seems to be to to release at least two films a year that she's starring in or that she's acting in. Um, she has an Iranian dad that she has really reconnected with in a big way in recent years and gone to Iran, in fact. Uh, she will join us. That's coming up. Plus, Chef Haas is going to be here with another edition of Hospitality. Keon, you're going to be back here with a It's All Persian to Us, an all-new episode. We will get to all of that. But first, let's get to our first guest today. She is an internationally recognized editor, author, TV commentator, diplomatic reporter, and foreign correspondent with special expertise in the Middle East and Asia. Barbara Slavin is the director of the Future of Iran Initiative at the Atlantic Council's South Asia Center. She is the author of a book about Iran-United States relations entitled Bitter Friends, Bosom Enemies, Iran, the U.S., and the Twisted Path to Confrontation. And Barbara Slavin joins me from Washington, D.C. right now. Hello. Hello. Very nice to have you on the program. You know, before we get specific about Iran, you're in D.C. It's a new era, at least some believe, in America as of yesterday's inauguration. Does it suddenly feel like there is a change in the air when it comes to a Biden administration and foreign affairs? Oh, yes. I mean, in, it's it's really in all areas. It's not just foreign affairs. It's it's really a new day, and and it's it's in some ways it's restoration in, instead of resistance. But I think we're going to go beyond that because there is so much urgent work that needs to be done uh, on foreign policy as well as domestic policy. Um, that uh, ah, where do we begin? But but I have some thoughts on that. <laughs> All right. Well, let's get into it then. You once tweeted at Iranian Foreign Minister Javad Zarif. Fix your own country first, we'll fix ours, uh, after he had criticized U.S. relations. I'm not sure how much effect it might have had, but it certainly (laughs) makes sense. You've now written a piece published last week called Advice to Iran as a New Administration Takes Over the White House. Do you suspect they will listen to you? I I hope so. I mean, I've, I've been fortunate, unlike most Americans, I at least until the last couple of years, was able to go to Iran on a rather regular basis. Uh, nine trips over about uh, 25 years. Uh, and over the course of, of those visits, uh, as a journalist primarily, um, I was able to meet not just the Javad Zarifs of this world, but the Ahmadinejads of this world, mm. uh, the, the Salihis, the Larijanis, uh, uh, the Rafsanjanis, etc. So I would say that... Uh, Although I haven't met the supreme leader, he doesn't give interviews to right. Western journalists. Right. Um, you know that that I've met uh, quite a, a cross section of of Iranian politicians and, of course, ordinary people. Um, so, look, I I don't as I as I pointed out in in that tweet, you know, especially after everything that's happened in the United States, we're not in a position to tell anybody what to do. I think in in domestic political terms. We have a big mess to clean up here still in the United States. But in terms of foreign policy and the suggestions that I made, you know, they have impact on Iranian foreign policy, even though some of them have some domestic uh, aspects to them, like uh, cleaning up the business environment and letting political prisoners, especially dual nationals, go. Um, But these are things that would put Uh, Iran's relations, not just with the United States, but with the international community on a much sounder footing. Uh, And so I hope that that some folks there there will listen. I just tweeted actually at Zarif this morning that we have a new B team in the United States. (laughs) You remember he talked about (laughs) Bolton, what was it? Bolton, uh, Mohammed bin Salman, and Bibi, Netanyahu, the B team, right? Well, we have a new B team now, and, and it's Biden, Blinken, and Burns. Right, right. Uh, Tony Blinken, who will be Secretary of State, Bill Burns, who will be CIA Director, as well as Joe Biden. And they're the A team. So, you know, Iran is going to have to up its game, I think. Well, in this piece, to get specific, you say, let me quote you, Iran should seize the opportunity to not only resume compliance with the 2015 Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action, so that's the JCPOA, but to establish a stronger foundation for the deal and for Iran's relations with its neighbors and the wider world. It sounds like you believe Biden's election suddenly represents a real opportunity for Iran. Do you? I do. And it's not just me. It's Iranians I've spoken with really think this is kind of Iran's last chance. I mean, does Iran want to be uh, stuck with China, Russia 
Uh, is that going to be Iran's orbit? I mean, does Iran want to be a sort of larger North Korea? Or does it want to have uh, a chance at, uh, you know, resuming what I think is its rightful stature as a large, well-educated country, so, uh, you know, geostrategically located between East and West and so on? Uh, this is Iran's chance. It has, if, if not an open door, certainly a receptive ear now in Washington. Uh, and so, uh, particularly while uh, Rouhani is president, Zarif is foreign minister, you know, the next uh, few months, they really should take advantage of this time uh, to get back, get back into the deal and then to build on it. At her first press briefing yesterday, I'm not sure if you were watching, it was, I was. <laughs> f- fun to watch a real press briefing once again, but the new White House Press Secretary, Jen Psaki, indicated that Iran and the nuclear deal will be very much part of the agenda as soon as President Biden begins meeting with allies, she said. Do you see this as a priority for Biden, the Iran, yes, very, the Iran deal? Yes, very much so, because everybody knows there's a short window. And of course, Iran has threatened, it's, Iran has already taken major steps out of the deal and has threatened to do much more, including reducing its cooperation with international inspectors and, and, and uh, uh, making uranium metal, which can be used for bombs as well as uh, for civilian purposes. So Iran has leverage. Iran is pushing. This, is, this was legislation that the Majlis uh, parliament passed uh, back in December. Um, and Iran is pushing for it. I think the Europeans are pushing for it. Uh, and, uh, and yeah, Biden would like to, to get this back in the box uh, and then broaden the discussion, as administration officials have said. And, and let me quote you again in this piece, because it's a, it's a really interesting one. You say the Iranian government should also signal to the Biden administration that it accepts the principle of follow-on negotiations to address the deficiencies of the JCPOA that have become even more apparent due to the Trump administration's withdrawal. Can you tell us a bit more of what you mean about there? Yeah. Look, from the U.S. side and, and the side of Europeans and others, uh, you know, the restrictions on Iran's nuclear program uh, under the deal uh, have sunset uh, years, and, and they're coming, and they're, they're coming fairly fast, although the main sunset in 2030, you know, we still have some time, and that's Iran is supposed to have no more than 300 kilograms of low-enriched uranium, which is only a quarter of what you would need if you wanted to build a single nuclear weapon. So I still think that that's the most important provision that, that we need to get restored. But there are other uh, restrictions on, uh, on uh, advanced centrifuges uh, and whatnot that, um, that are coming due sooner. Uh, there are provisions in there about the additional protocol of the Nuclear Nonproliferation Treaty. Uh, the Iranian parliament is supposed to pass that, I believe, in 2023. U.S. is supposed to legislate uh, sanctions relief in 2023. Uh, right now, it, it's all been done through executive orders, both uh, relieving them and reimposing them, and I assume right. relieving them again. So, I mean, from Iran's perspective, um, it would like to see some of these, uh, some of the sanctions relief on a firmer footing and probably more sanctions relief including the primary sanctions that prevent almost all U.S. trade with uh, an investment in Iran. Uh, I mean, if, if Iran promises more, the U.S. might offer more. Uh, that's logical. Um, there are also issues about missiles and about Iran's regional activities that are of concern in Washington. I think those have to be discussed in a regional context, which the United States can certainly support, although probably uh, not lead. Um, so there, there are those issues. Um, I think from the Iranian point of view, uh, especially the ease with which Trump was able to just leave it, they don't want that to happen again. So if there's a way to prevent that from happening, I think that would be enormous benefit to the Iranian economy and, um, you know, just to the whole psychology of the country, which has been so beaten down yeah. uh, by everything that's happened. Let me ask you what you expect the Iranian regime to do. In other words, not what they should do, because you've given them your advice, but but <laughs> what you suspect they will do. There, There is a school of thought, uh, I mean, you, you've probably heard this, that says Iranian leadership prefers a hawkish leader like Trump so that it can continue to engineer consent for its own hawkish policies ostensibly in response do you mm. do you think there's any credence to that yeah i think there is a chunk of the uh the you know the political system that does like a donald trump uh he was very useful for them because they could say look the united states is not trustworthy uh you know our future does not lie to the west it lies to the east 
Um, and so for those folks, you know, Trump was a godsend, the same way that Ahmadinejad was a godsend for Bibi Netanyahu, right? Uh, because Iran became toxic under his uh, leadership, and of course the U.S. became toxic under under Donald Trump, and certainly isolated in a way that we had not seen uh, before. So they they will mourn uh, his, uh, you know, Trump's passing from the scene. Um, but there are many others uh, within the system, and certainly without, uh, who are you know breathing a huge sigh of relief and say, okay, now we can, you know, we have a chance, we can get back to business. And this is particularly true because of the personnel that are coming into the Biden administration, who many of them involved with Iran with negotiating the original deal. Uh, you know, we still have uh, Iranian negotiators who, who have that experience and who can just get back into it, you know, without, without tremendous difficulty. Um, and I believe there have been some indications that Iran has already said that the, their UN ambassador, uh, Majid Takhravanchi, former deputy foreign minister, uh, who participated, uh, was very important in the negotiations, that he now has the freedom to uh, reach out to his American counterparts and begin this process. Um, and, you know, once our Secretary of State is in place, there's also a rumor that a man named Rob Malley uh, will be named Iran envoy. And Rob worked for Obama, he's mm. head of the International Crisis Group now, but he has a lot of experience dealing with Iran and with the Middle East under the Obama administration. So, I mean, if we have him as an envoy, uh, you know, I think we'll be able to make very quick progress. We need to have a sequence of steps um, that, uh, you know, provide sanctions relief to Iran in return for concrete steps returning to the original deal. And then some ideas about follow-on. You, you've you've mentioned Netanyahu a couple of times. How I mean, it sort of begs the question: how, how is the Biden administration going to navigate a relationship with Israel if it wishes to return to the JCPOA? Uh, not to mention bilateral talks, let's say, with Iran, especially given Biden's public solidarity with Israel. What mm -hmm. what what do you see the the way to navigate that as for the Biden administration? Well, I think Israel will be consulted, but they're, you know, they can't tell Biden what to do. And remember that Bibi had, you know, really burned his bridges with many Democrats, uh, the way in which he lobbied against the original deal, coming to address a joint session of Congress when Congress was under Republican control to inveigh against the JCPOA when it was in its final stages of negotiation. Uh, he welcomed Mitt Romney in 2012, the Republican candidate for president. I mean, he has, he put his, almost all his chips in the Republican basket uh, a long time ago. And so he doesn't have that many friends in Washington in this administration. Uh, you know, there is the, the sort of dutiful uh, regurgitation of, you know, the line that the U.S. will always protect Israel's security. And I think, you know, it's more than, than lip service. But that doesn't mean we take uh, instruction from him. And of course, there's going to be a shocking change in, in U.S. relations with Saudi Arabia as well. So uh, that B team, uh, as far as Bibi and, and bin Salman, uh, you know, just doesn't have the clout that it did. Um, and so I don't, I don't see them as being a major impediment. If you look at the op-ed pages, you know, the, the neocons and a bunch of former Israeli ambassadors and the, the, founda the so-called foundation for defensive democracies run by uh, a guy named Mark Dubowitz, who is uh, yeah. actually Canadian, and uh, I wish he'd stayed there, no offense. Uh, <laughs> you know, they're all saying, oh, don't go back to the Iran deal. Don't squander your leverage. And they're using the same old tired arguments that they used uh, five years ago to to try to prevent the deal from from going into force. Uh, no, thank you. I, I, actually, I'm going to ask you about that. I'm going to ask you about the, the the reaction of the Iranian American community. Uh, but but first, let me just uh, what what do you believe the prospects are for prisoner exchanges? I think they're good. Um, I, I noticed that on its last day, the uh, Trump administration arrested uh, uh, yet another Iranian, accused him of being an unregistered lobbyist. Uh, professor in, uh, in in Massachusetts. So, I mean, he looks ready to swap, and I'm sure there are others in the system. And there are, you know, there are dual nationals like Sia Maknamazi, who's been held for more than five years, who never should have been arrested. I mean, you know, please let him go, uh, should be one of the first things. This, this, should, this should be relatively uh, rapid once we get the, the State Department up and running. Um, 
And then, you know, Iran has to stop taking new ones. I mean, this soured the atmosphere, frankly, back, uh, you know, five, six years ago when Siamak was, was taken, uh, when the JCPOA was just coming into force. Now, I know that there are elements of the Iranian security state that, that seem to have carte blanche to do this sort of stuff. But, uh, you know, the supreme leader can tell them to, to cut it out. Uh, so I, I hope that will happen. Um, it's it's Iran, so you know uh, bad things happen all the time. Yeah, but, uh, yeah. There's only so um, much you can expect from a there's only murderous so regime. Can, yeah, <laughs> exactly. So you know, there's only so much you can expect. But this this is seems to be clearly in Iranian national interest if they want to get sanctions relief. There's a lot of focus on the, uh, rightly so, of course, on the new president and the Biden administration uh, uh, at the White House. But just out of curiosity, how does a Democratic House and Senate now change things when it comes to Iran? Well, again, you know, if we're talking about legislating sanctions relief instead of just doing it through executive order, uh, you know, you have obviously a a much better opportunity. It's still not going to be easy because there are uh, Democrats who uh, have not been uh, terribly enthusiastic about the JCPOA, including the the new uh, head of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, Senator Menendez of New Jersey. Uh, but you have a shot. I mean, if you have a majority, you can you can get it through. Uh, it's not two thirds. It's not veto proof. It's not treaty. You know, you need two thirds for a treaty. But simple acts of legislation, you should be able to get through. And it becomes much harder for Congress to block. The other thing, of course, is that Democrats will control the committee process, which means you'll have hearings where you might actually have supporters of the Iran deal testifying instead of the the same old critics. You know, we've had nothing but, uh, at least on the Senate side, you know, we've had excessive attention to the views of critics uh, rather than proponents of the JCPOA. So it, it changes the mood. Um, and, uh, you know, frankly, 2022, uh, there are opportunities, particularly in the Senate, I think, to strengthen the Democratic uh, majority, especially if Trump uh, acts the spoiler and goes after a lot of senators who he thinks were not sufficiently loyal to him, hmm. uh, you know, and, and tries to, to primary them, as we call it. Um, you know, there, there could be some good opportunities there. Uh, but at least we have two years in which Congress and congressional opposition will be less of a factor in, in both domestic and foreign policy. Let me ask you about the critics that you just mentioned, particularly even within our, our diaspora, the Iranian community. Mm-hmm. How, how do you see the Iranian-American community responding to the Biden administration? Mm-hmm. As you may know, I, I, would say, I would presume, the community in some ways is as divided as America itself in terms of there being many Iranians, especially on the West Coast, who supported Trump and thought he was the, the best bet for a regime change in Iran somehow. What, what is yeah. your sense of how the community sees things? I think the majority is relieved, and uh, I haven't seen a breakdown on the on the vote for Biden, but I would assume a large majority of Iranian Americans um, supported uh, Biden, uh, not just because of Iran uh, policy, but because of things like the Muslim ban, which is now gone. Yay! Iranians should be able to apply to come to the United States. Right, <laughs> right. Within a day. Um, it's amazing. Yeah, it's you am- know, it's, yeah. Just, it's amazing. So things like that, certainly uh, the Islamophobia of the Trump administration was certainly a concern for a lot of people. Um, look, there were some vocal groups that supported Trump uh, on the very naive belief that he was going to bring down the Islamic Republic. Um, it was never going to happen. I mean, what his policy did was immiserate uh, a country of 80 million people, uh, made life even more difficult for them than it has already been. Uh, but, you know, the when you have a situation under sanctions, it means that the regime controls precious hard currency, and it strengthens itself at the expense of everyone else. Um, so, you know, I think they were naive. I, I think some of them, many of them were extremely well-meaning. Some of them, frankly, less so. Um, you know, we still have elements of the Mujahideen Hulk. Um, the, we also have a lot of monarchists who somehow think that the, the son of the last Shah is, is going to go back to Iran and reestablish, you know, yeah. the monarchy yeah. or be a constitutional monarch or something like yeah. that. Um, you know, it was never going to happen. And so I think they, I think like many uh, Trump supporters, they got conned. They got duped. 
into thinking that he was going to do something for them when it was always only about him. I think the the um, the latest figures or the, the the last figures I heard they were from about a month ago were that there was seventy percent. Uh, approval of or support for Biden in the Iranian American community, which is Isn't that fascinating. Well, it's huge, but same, but it also yeah. suggests that there's 30 percent who really yeah. uh, didn't uh, don't support uh, Biden, and you know we hear from them. I mean, they're yeah, they'll they will disagree with what you're saying right now, and they will disagree with the JCPOA. And yeah, and let me end off with a. Uh, um, an impossible question. <laughs> Sorry, yeah, but but it's an inevitable one. You follow Iran. You write about the Iranian situation from all kinds of angles, Barbara. There have been moments. I mean, they they one doesn't want to get one's hopes up. But like the November 2019 protests, or even more recently under sanctions and the COVID situation, where there's been this presumption that this regime in Iran is on its last legs, that it it has to topple a young population in Iran, won't stand for it much longer. There's so much resistance. There's so many pockets of protest. And, and then it, it just keeps on going on. What, what does your crystal ball tell you about the coming few years for Iran and its leadership? I have, I have no crystal ball, but uh, I have covered the Soviet Union and communist China. I know a failed revolution when I see one. Um, there, there will be change. There must be change. It may be that it's just in terms of the economy and personal life that uh, it will be the China model, that it will, it will open up and, you know, uh, things like the enforced hijab and all the rest will go by the wayside. I mean, there's already been a huge relaxation of a lot of these, you know, anybody who started going to Iran 20 years ago knows there was no music, that women were all, you know, draped in black. I mean, wow. all of that has changed dramatically. So we might, we might see a sort of China model of... of um, easing up on on personal life and economic life to some extent. Um, that I can can foresee. In terms of a, of a wholesale change of the system, um, look, Ayatollah Khamenei has to go, and that will happen, presumably in the next decade or so, although some of these mullahs seem to have, last you know, forever. I don't know, yeah, they, yeah. Uh, they last forever. They really do last forever. Um, but but he'll have to go. Then there'll be a decision. Is he replaced by one person, by a council? Uh, will the elected offices become stronger and, and the, the guardianship there weaker? Um, what happens to the guardian council? But, but I think I, I do know this, that when a country that has been a pariah state establishes relations with the United States, has detente with the United States, and opens up a bit, um, you know, good things tend to happen and hardliners tend to get marginalized. Um, we have seen this pattern, uh, at least for a while with the Soviet Union, uh, certainly with China for many years until Xi Jinping. It's no guarantee. Um, but knowing the, the caliber of the Iranian people, the level of education, um, the degree of discontent in the country, you know, I think there's a fair shot at it. My fear, frankly, is that all the best and brightest will continue to leave mm. and come to the U.S. now again, go to Canada, go to Europe, go to Australia, go to England, um, you know, as, as they have done, uh, you know, over the last 40 years. And, and those left behind will just, you know, you know, kind of grin and bear it or not grin and bear it, but uh, that the security apparatus will keep them in check. There are a lot of different pathways for Iran, um, but there is an opportunity now with Biden at least to eliminate U.S.-Iran hostility as the, the scapegoat for everything that's wrong in the country when we know so much of what's wrong is, is, is indigenous, is part of the regime. So, you know, I hope, I hope people there can take advantage of it. Um, I hope I get to see the country again. I haven't been there, you know, through all this long period. I hope I can go without getting arrested. <laughs> um, as do we all. You know, uh, I hope a lot of other people can too. And, and we can resume the people-to-people -people engagement, the wrestling matches, the volleyball matches, all the good <laughs> stuff that was, was happening before. Um, I hope it can happen again. That was pretty good for no crystal ball. Mm, well, 
Yeah, I don't know. We'll see. <laughs> I appreciate we'll it. We'll see. Listen, I know you're busy. I know you've had, uh, you, you, I'm sure there's many demands on your time, especially at this moment. I thank you so much for taking the time today and for, for your insights. Uh, really appreciate it, and I hope we can do it again. Thank you. It's a pleasure. Your, your voice is familiar to me, and it's nice to hear it again. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks. Bye. Barbara Slavin is a journalist and the director of the Future of Iran Initiative at the Atlantic Council's South Asia Center. Her latest opinion piece is entitled Advice to Iran as a new administration takes over the White House. Barbara Slavin joined us from Washington, D.C. today. You are listening to Rook on SoundCloud, Spotify, iTunes, Telegram, Instagram, and YouTube. Coming up in just a little bit, Maya Sansa, the actress, uh, the star actress in Italy, who is currently now in Paris, France, where she lives, um, has had a stellar career over the last couple of decades, uh, and has an Iranian dad that she has, uh, I guess, reconciled with, reconnected with, and and is... uh, um, really experiencing her Persian roots in a new way. Uh, she will be joining us in just a little bit from Paris. And Chef Haas with another installation of hospitality is coming up. Uh, okay, let's get the uh, Rook team microphones on. Uh, let's get to our next segment because, well, she is a woman of letters. Rook <laughs> letters, that is. A dear friend, a diaspora blend, a gym fanatic, mm. a kook who can be erratic, but lovable, <laughs> smart, and funny, and on a journey to discover what we actually discovered. Here we go, Bachaha. It's all Persian to us with Kian Nademi. Uh, yeah. All right. Okay. Well. What do you have for us for today? Well, let me just start by saying with so much negative attention around Iranians over the past few decades, it's so easy to assume that what mainstream media or Hollywood portrays us as, that being terrorists, is really who we are. Mm. Now, that Mm. simply is not true, as we all know. And I'm here to remind the world that Iranians are so much more than that. The people of Iran and the government running Iran are not one and the same. So I'd like to change the story and focus on some of the positive aspects of Iranian culture. You're going to change the narrative. That's what I'm going to do. That's All what right. I'm here to do, Jian. You go. Where and more have you specifically, been the past years? <laughs> <laughs> more specifically, the positive contributions from Iranians to yes. the world. Yes. So many countries around the world are currently in lockdown. With nowhere to go, most people are finding new ways to keep themselves entertained at home, whether it be working out, reading, trying new hobbies, or cooking for example mm. now most people like myself cooking don't we invented cooking <laughs> Sorry. can i can i i'll finish? try not to get ahead of it <laughs> i mean uh, well uh, maybe lockdowns maybe. <laughs> we invented lockdowns no that's terrible yeah, you're ruining probably, my sex we probably <laughs> did <laughs> 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 first lockdown yeah so now uh now we had first lockdown <laughs> in <laughs> it started in Grom. should yeah. i walk they my they were locking down everything iran and Iraq war <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to walk myself out <laughs> right now. <laughs> now, most people like myself don't cook every day. That would simply be exhausting. Us modern humans like to cook in large quantities and store it for a few days to consume later. Now, the, especially the Persians. Persian cuisine itself takes j- hours to prepare, like gorma sabzi, for example. Mm-hmm. Anyone who's ever made that knows what I'm talking about. Yes, sister. So, of course, they had to come up with a crafty new way to store this precious, delicious food, especially during the hot summer months. Tupperware. We invented Tupperware. <laughs> Sorry. No. I actually know, wh- could, I know where this is going, actually. I do. <laughs> and this I know could, this one. This could only be possible by the world's first ever... Refrigerator. There you oh, go. For real? Oh, oh, yes, yes. The very first refrigerator, or the yachchal, wow. which literally translates to ice pit, was an invention by the Persians. Oh. Yes. Sometime around 400 BC, those crafty ancient Persians living in the middle of the hot desert created a subterranean storage space. 
This ancient fridge was built inside an above-ground dome-shaped structure made with sand, clay, egg whites, lime, what? goat, goat egg whites. Egg whites. Yes. Can I continue? The, the, the chrome <laughs> shaped. <laughs> I want to talk the about dome it. Shaped it gets, what? It gets more interesting. Goat hair, naturally, what? and ash, which functions as an insulator. Yes, okay. yes. So, uh, sorry, there was a something that they put in a dome-shaped. Building so it was ground. like a it was underground storage space built within a dome shape. Uh, yes, using egg yolk. Uh, that being <laughs> one of the ingredients. Egg goat, and goat's feet. What I what I find, yeah. Goat hair being the surprising uh, mixture, uh, but you you work with what you have, and that's that's sure we the have best a lot of eggs. <laughs> yeah, why not? And goat hair. <laughs> <laughs> So this yachtchal acted. This as is a, the, by the way, the dome structure <laughs> is much more interesting than the yachtchal. <laughs> this dome structure that we created out of egg yolk. <laughs> the I, mean, uh, yacht I ever want to learn <laughs> next week. Can you make it? <laughs> we should try making it actually. <laughs> so uh, let me elaborate. So this yachtchal acted as a type of evaporative cooler, cooling the inside with air through the ev- evaporation of water. Now, during the winter months, ice was collected from nearby mountains and stored inside this insulated structure, and also used underground water channels called canots, mm-hmm. which had cold water flowing through from the local mountains to the shaded side of this ancient fridge. The mix of cooling waters that spiraled down its side, along with a system of wind catchers and wind towers, kept the ice stored there in winters, frozen throughout the summers. Oh. These buildings also had a trench at the bottom to catch molten ice and allow it to refreeze during the cold desert nights. The thick walls of the dome, sometimes as thick as two meters, I bet it's all that goat hair, (laughs) kept the ice cold all year, meaning that delicious gormasabzi that takes approximately six hours, I might be exaggerating, to make, or that tasty ice cream could be stored and enjoyed year round. Now, Yachtchals were the forerunners. Saffron ice cream. <laughs> Saffron <laughs> yes, ice cream. delicious. Rose, rose water. Mm. <laughs> Falude, anybody? Mm. Now, Yachtchals were the forerunners of modern day thermal energy storage systems, which we now know as refrigerators. Oh. Some of these buildings were so well built that there's still a few of them standing today in Iran. Anybody oh. know where they are? Uh. Yazd. Uh, the, yeah, the, there's does. actually a few. No. <laughs> actually, they were, they were pretty popular in Isfahan, but oh, really? uh, yeah. So, uh, yeah. I'm and not going to lie to you. When you started talking about goat hair and wh- egg white, I was like, this is the kind of refrigerator Hannibal Lecter would make. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, Are these refrigerators, mm-hmm. like back in the day when they first invented the refriger- refrigerator, did they have the kind where you could put your cup and the water <laughs> comes out and you warm I or know. cold water? Well, if there you, was. If you press it against the. Well, kind the of. Lever, I mean, there, there was water flowing from the local mountains and they had these underground tunnels built to kind of use as a cooling system. So, yes, you See? could technically good at this. Put, no, bring no, out your no, cup no, and no, gather no, some no. water in your uh, local water. Uh, what do you call it? Fountain. Mountain water. <laughs> so. And so us food-obsessed Shikamu Persians simply had to create the first prototype for the refrigerator in ancient times so we could consume delicious food year-round. It's all Persian to us. Mm. Did anybody know this one? I did know that one. Did you? Yeah, I did. There's there's some guy on the internet who did like 10 things that Iranians invented. I I always remember that one was one of them, like... uh, the refrigerator. Yeah. Um, although it sounds like a, <laughs> it's a very interesting thing for Iranians to invent too in, in, in the middle of the you know heat. Well, that's the thing. They didn't have the blessing of year-round winter. I don't know if you would call that a blessing, but so they were stuck in the middle of the desert, so they had mm-hmm. to come up with a way to preserve foods yeah. throughout the summertime. And You know what's wild too is they built these dome-like structures <laughs> using goat's hair <laughs> and egg white. Uh, yeah. Uh, Rez is going to go experiment in the kitchen now. The eyeballs of a small. <laughs> <laughs> it's like some potion. And, and <laughs> one, one feather from. <laughs> and some egg, egg yolks. Or egg uh, whites. Um, that is great, Keon. Great background. Great. Uh, uh, that was a, a great story. And and uh, who knew? So what, what, what? Where's our list at right now? We've got so alcohol, mm, postal service, wine, wine. alcohol. What was the other Wonder one? Wonder Woman. Yes. Wonder yes, Woman. Yes. yes. And? No, well, uh, yeah, well, well Amazon, the, Amazon, Amazon Woman. The background of yeah, it. Yeah. And, and now the refrigerator. Indeed. Key on me. Very well done. It is all Persian to us.
Well, my next guest is an acclaimed actress who has made a name for herself across Europe, starring in numerous beloved films over the last two decades. Maya Sansa was born in Rome to an Italian mother and an Iranian father. When she was 14, Maya started studying acting at her high school. Soon after that, she moved to London, where she lived for many years and graduated in acting from the Guildhall School of Music and Drama in 1999. And right thereafter, Maya was selected by Marco Bellocchio to take part in his new film, La Baglia, The Nanny. That was a role that would win her an Italian Golden Globe Award for Best Breakthrough Actress and a Golden Chak Award for Best Supporting Actress. Maya later worked with Marco Bellocchio two more times, starring in the film Good Morning Night and Dormant Beauty. She has also worked with Marco Tullio Giordana in the film The Best of Youth. Last year alone, Maya appeared in two feature films, Sisters in Arms and The Truth, and this year she was at the Venice Film Festival with a new film called You Came Back, and she also shot a film entitled Azzurro in the middle of the COVID-19 pandemic in France, and right now, Maya Sansa joins me from Paris, France. Hello. Hello, hello. Thank you. What a lovely introduction. <laughs> Thank what you. What a uh, pleasure it is to have you on this program. Thank you for making the time. By the way, you know that Iranians tend to claim everything as our own, right? So have we managed to claim you as entirely ours yet? <laughs> or <laughs> <laughs> No, but it, it is true that sometimes my father tells me, oh, there is something about you being Iranian on some Iranian website. Or, so it, it, it does happen. And I'm kind of kind of proud of it i'm very happy of my iranian half i i want to come back to i don't want to ask you about identity and uh, that's at the root of what this program's about so i'll get i'll get to that but um maya let me first ask you about being an actress in this strange year you are so prolific in your work a, a pace of it seems at least two films a year how badly was your world rocked by this covid pandemic this year well, you know, it's always very peculiar, like the career of an actor. Sometimes even without the pandemic, we have months without work. So this year I was kind of, um, paradoxically, I was quite lucky because I worked right after the beginning of the first confinement. So I was working with um, Peter Chelsom, this English director, playing this um, very interesting role in this film called Security. Um, and um, and then there were rumors about the pandemic and we were still wondering what would have happened. And then when the confinement started, when the lockdown happened, I was kind of strangely enough enjoying some rest being at home with my child with my with my love with the father of my child with Fabrice and um and I kind of managed somehow to stay psychologically serene even though everything that was happening was quite worrying and obviously I was concerned about what was going on in Italy but in my microcosm my home in my personal life it kind of happened um, in a softer way than for many other people are you generally good at psychologically serene <laughs> I don't know. I hope so. It depends on the. Sometimes I think, oh my God, this is, this is great. I'm dealing with this fine. I mean, this, it, whatever is happening that is, that might be problematic. And then some other times for something really silly, which wouldn't even be difficult to deal with, I'm, I'm struggling. Mm. <laughs> so, so I don't know if I'm serene or I, I kind of, I'm up and down, up and down, like most creative people can be. It depends. Did you is it is it true that you shot this film Azuro as well during this year during, during the pandemic? Yes, during the summer. How does it work on set? How do you how does this actually what are the mechanics of doing this shoot when everyone's rightly concerned about infection? I mean, we heard recently um, you know, this I don't know if it went viral in Europe, but but certainly in North America there was Tom Cruise had had this kind of um they called it a meltdown, but really he was just upset because uh he's on the set of shooting Mission Impossible and there were some people getting too close to each other and he was screaming saying, you know, we've got to be careful of the virus otherwise they'll shut down our movie what what was your experience like trying to do your well, work during this uh it, it was fine actually because it's it's uh it was a very small film um with uh with the actors were very few we were six actors we did like a small 
pre-confinement before the beginning of the shoot and then we were shooting on the on the beach um all the members of the crew were wearing masks but the air was uh, very clean we were near the beach uh, it was sunny it was qu quite warm apparently the heat really helps uh, the virus not to spread and um it was right after the lockdown so everybody was kind of cheerful we hoped that it was almost behind us so there was a lot of serenity i think now there is much more pressure and of course on a set like mission impossible i think the crew must be like a uh, huge yes, yes like there are so many people working on it and it's much more complicated we were following protocol but we were not particularly stressed you've done such interesting work uh, especially recently that i mean bef right before the pandemic you, you shot a film that came out recently as well called sisters in arms and, and interestingly enough doing a film set sort of uh in the middle east and uh, middle eastern women uh, with someone with your background I, I wondered if there was an interesting underlying resonance for you somehow you know Oh yes, there was. I have to say, my 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 father has always been um, um, very keen and close to the Kurdish culture, and um, this uh, also this fight for freedom, for for women and uh, for independence and uh, freedom of thought and religion. It's uh, it's it's very important to us. And I grew up in an environment that is clearly not uh, comfortable with any kind of oppression and so these women represent my modern heroines to me so it was a real honor to play a character uh, an italian soldier i mean an italian civilian that decides to join uh, the kurdish women uh, to fight against isis you know, I, I mentioned that you are very prolific. I mean, your IMDb is full of credits. You're famous. You're award-winning. You're remarkably talented. It would seem you are living the dream. Was this always the dream? Are you living what you um, hoped your life would be when you were a kid growing up in Rome? Well, it's pretty close. I think um, um, what it's very nice growing up is that your awareness of what you really uh, dream for yourself changes. So maybe as a kid, um, the dream was uh, more vague. Somehow, you yeah, you want to be an actor. You you hope of being uh, recognized and to be able to to be appreciated. And 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 growing up, this thing obviously maybe also because I have achieved some of it all, um, but changes in a way that I think. Maybe in my twenties, I was kind of dreaming of uh, um, of an even bigger celebrity. When now I kind of appreciate being able to be um, a working actor even more than mm. being a celebrity, if, if you see what I mean. Mm -hmm. So it's great to have my 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 private life uh, in Paris, where I've worked less than in Italy. So it's quite. You know, it's not every day that somebody recognizes me and I have lots of good friends and my daughter has a very mm, easy life, um, simple life like any other kid. But at the same time, then every time I go to Italy, I have all that warmth and uh, and uh, the pleasure that comes with the fact that you get recognized and that people appreciate what you do and they want to communicate with you. And uh, so I think I found a very good... Um, very good compromise when you want to when you want to feel beloved and super famous you just take the train uh, across the border to italy and and then come back. exactly <laughs> exactly and that, I, that's and I handy my it's... sunglasses and i try to be very very recognizable <laughs> that's very handy i mean you have quite consistently stayed in europe is it is it a conscious choice to avoid hollywood and say that that uh, blockbuster uh, mission impossible film we were talking about moments ago Oh no, not at all. I think I would have so much fun being in a big production and and um, when I did, um, even though it, it isn't as big as Mission Impossible and it's not even a movie, it's a, it's a TV show, but I had a great time working on Collateral yes. by S.J. Clarkson in London, which is the place, you know, it's my kind of 
now it's third home, but for many years I, I, I thought of London as my second home, but now having lived in Paris for many more years, it's become Paris. But, um, I was so happy to be working in London, to be shooting in English, to, to be part of a kind of, um, action spy thriller. You know, to me, all that, it's, it's great fun. And I think I would be very happy even today to be in a big production. Like I had so much fun doing sisters, playing in sisters in arms. Like it's a, obviously I see the noble side of it all, the, the, the poetic and the heroic aspect of the film and, uh, historical, but, but there is the fun side as well. It was like an action movie and, um, it had been uh, a bit of a dream, you know, for many years to be part of an action film because I started with, um, with Bellocchio and therefore, you know how it is when you're an actor very often you're you're very much put into a um a um, box <laughs> exactly in yeah, your box yeah. and you become the the muse of a of an author you become like an intellectual actor or uh, when it's just etiquettes that are put onto you you know what i mean and uh, uh, i was coming from an english school we had a very good uh, um training like physical training i was you know i loved dancing and i love acrobatics and i loved all that and i was kind of you know uh, put into something that was much more uh, yeah, very refined and very very sophisticated and very um, inspiring but far away from uh, from all the other things I could have I could have done and as actors I think we love doing different things but celebrated too I mean you're being a little bit modest you were of course famously I guess it was the New York Times uh, that declared you oh, a, that was so you know in, uh, the, the, the new face of Italian cinema um, which is no small weight to carry but you know for you you're suddenly okay now I've got to be the new face of uh, Italian cinema but but you mentioned Bellocchio I mean how did it, it actually happen the story is you were living with your single mom and grandmother in Rome you decide to study acting in high school school you go to London when you're 18 and you study exactly. there how, how do you go from studying acting to being a, a major actress in a Bellocchio movie oh that was that was amazing I was um well let's say my first dream going step by step was to get into this drama school going to London and get an English training because the English actors American actors English speaking actors let's say were very much there for me and I was in total admiration so I wanted to follow the same path and when I when I was training in London obviously my idea was to carry on working and living in England but then I had this wonderful opportunity during the Easter holiday to to audition for Bellocchio and that was thanks via via a friend um, whose name is Andrea Di Stefano you might know him he heard of this project so he said to the casting director he said look there is this friend of mine she's amazing I mean <laughs> I say it because he said it but obviously <laughs> and so when I went to Rome I met this casting director so Bellocchio knew nothing about it of course and she said hmm she's interesting why not let's give her the opportunity to meet uh, Bellocchio and then I started to I met Bellocchio and and then he said okay let's audition her so the long process started it wasn't at all like oh she's nice let's take her <laughs> it was like okay now she can be um between the thousands of <laughs> in the middle of the thousands of actors that i'm auditioning and so little by little audition after audition i think it was six i finally got the part and that was amazing. It was like a fabulous encounter. Meeting Bellocchio has really been like a marvelous gift because he's a he's an incredible director. It's not, it's not just like, oh, I managed to do my first film. No, it's more like I met an amazing artist that taught me so much about everything, not just um not just acting or or acting for camera. It was just like um yeah, I met a maestro, you know, and that changes a lot of things in people's life. Maya, how did you handle the sudden um, attention, that uh, global attention that, that came with that? You said a few moments ago that you, there was a time when you were aspiring towards even bigger celebrity. Um, how, how did a young Maya Sansa, I mean, it wasn't that long ago, but it was you were, you were young. It yeah, was, no, uh, of course, it was a while ago. ago. You're how, right. <laughs> how, how, uh, how, did you, how did you deal with that, do you feel? Um, hmm, how did I deal with that? Well, the pressure wasn't that 
strong, you know, just because, as I said, it's all in the European art house, uh, like Cannes Film Festival. You know, you, I didn't have access to the big crowds. You know, if you see what I mean, it's like uh, Milok is not a is not a, a director that um, millions of of people go and see. Usually, are people that are um, cinephile. You know that they love cinema yes. and they want to see the the best director in town. But it doesn't mean it's a blockbuster. So it wasn't, I didn't have that much uh, pressure to deal with uh, as far as relating to people is concerned. But with the press, it was quite intense. It was quite intense. And I was um, good at it because I think I was very young and spontaneous. I find it harder today sometimes, you know, because uh, when you're young, you just say what's crossing your mind and <laughs> and people appreciate it because you're 22 years old and and also because very often when you're 22 23 you have so many things to say you know there is all that enthusiasm and all that right. passion yeah. which i think is still there of course i love my job but but um you you're always afraid of being maybe too naive or or um, you know to um or not specific enough or not interesting enough you know it's uh, it becomes harder with time but i felt it was a lot it was a lot and uh, and uh, Bilaki was so generous that he would take me uh, with with the film with him everywhere to present the film so i traveled a lot and it was amazing i was always ready with my luggage to go to film festivals around the world mm. i went to to japan i went to uruguay i went to lebanon um it was it was so amazing for a 23 year old um actress in those years as well you know now so much has changed yes you know everything happens on instagram facebook and yes. but uh at the time you had to be there and it was uh but there wasn't all the infrastructure that there is today you know i wasn't accompanied by a manager by makeup artists by stylists very often i was like in my jeans and t-shirt and no mm. makeup and feeling like oh my god how am i gonna do this you know always sometimes i would i would feel happy because i was just myself and sometimes i would feel panicked because i would think of the big divas of you know of the past or the present and it was exciting but frightening at times i can imagine Mm -hmm. let, let, let me get to this identity question, Maya, because the, the heart of this program is exploring the stories of those of us like you and I, who are of Iranian descent uh, in one form or another in the diaspora. So, so let me get this straight. Your mom is from Turin. Your grandmother has Czechoslovakian roots. Your father is Iranian. Yeah. You grew up in Rome. You lived in the UK. You live in France now. Um, <laughs> what, what is your take on on nationality? I mean, how, how do you self-identify? Well, it's uh, it's difficult. You know, it's it's. Uh, I mean, it's difficult and not. I think it's uh, you. You feel a citizen of the world somehow, so you have much less. Um, much less of an attachment to an ident to a specific identity, but I have to say that, of course, because I grew up in Italy, very often uh, having left when I when I was in Italy, I felt I was not very Italian. You know, it was a way of maybe affirming myself, but it was very important to recognize that I wasn't just Italian, and I felt it. Like my mum and my grandmother, with whom I spend more time than with my dad, even though now he's very present in my life, always said it. You have such a, you have a sensitivity that comes from somewhere else. Like even though they're, you know, we always think of Italians as being very, very warm, very spontaneous, very, um, very Mediterranean. But my mother and my grandmother are a women of the north somehow so even though they're warm women and and uh they have much more i don't know more control more uh, they don't have this uh, hypersensitivity that it's, I a, it's a bit ironic though isn't it that you given mm. that you were considered the definitive face of italian cinema that you were the, the this italian actress that you would feel a little out of step with being italian when in italy Yes, yes, it's funny, but it, but it, but it's so true. Like somehow my sensitivity, what I use the most for my acting, um, I think it comes more from from Persia, from my Persian origins, because it comes from my dad, 
and um, and and everything else. I mean, the education, uh, the discipline, the determination. Uh, even though probably it's also very much uh, an Iranian thing, it comes from my mom because and my grandmother because I've been uh, brought up by them. But but my my nature, my my really the way I relate to things, my my love for 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 everything that is poetic and beautiful and and profound uh, I think it comes very much from from my dad and from my Iranian origins and even my sensitivity on, on in French we say a fleur de peau oh. or 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 without skin uh, sometimes in Italian we say senza pelle also I think comes from that my dad is very it's a very strong man but extremely sensitive extremely yeah that's um, a, that sounds Iranian <laughs> yeah, exactly. So that's where it comes from. My sister is 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 totally like me, and we only have our dad in common. So <laughs> when did you realize? She's got another mom. When did you realize you have Iranian roots? Because I know obviously you were brought up with with your mom and grandmother. Uh, w w was this something you were aware of as a kid? Did you have well, Iranian soon, friends? It, you... It's funny because I always remember people saying, "Oh my God, you're even even you know when I was a kid, I think." Uh, Shoraya was very much in fashion for the for the for the population for Italians, you know. And so sometimes I would have these ladies coming to me and say, "Yeah, yeah, put, put yeah, they would put a scarf right under my eyes and say, "Yes, you have Iranian eyes. Oh my God, you're Persian. You're so pretty, you know." They would really uh, romanticize the whole thing, and uh, so I was very much aware of it. And then I remember once thing seeing. Um, do you remember the, the film Never? Uh, the never ending story of course yeah and 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 reading somewhere like on a magazine for kids that the girl had iranian origins and so i had decided that she was either half sister or cousin <laughs> you know and i you know the the magic world of children and and i felt very much like i was a persian princess myself so it's always been present in a very in a very beautiful way you know my you weren't my discriminated Iranian against uh, the kids did at school didn't know that you were did they know you were iranian did they ever say anything about that they knew it they uh, the the closer the kids that were closer to me knew it and uh, it's always been um uh something positive something seen as uh mysterious uh, magical from far away you know uh yeah royal kind of you know uh, nothing never something uh, uh that gave an opportunity to 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 people to be disagreeable with me the opposite that's so nice to so, hear the, very nice the, the story goes that you you, I don't know if I have this right. You met your father when you were fifteen for the first time. Yes. So yes. can you tell us about that encounter? I mean that that would be mm. life changing. I can imagine. <laughs> that was yeah. That was very special. You know, it, it was special times. The seventies when my father and my mom met, and um, to make a long story short, they decided to go on different paths, but they had the reasons. So I never felt any resentment towards uh, neither one or the other. You weren't angry with him growing up? No, not at all. Um, yeah, of course, when I was an adolescent and I met him and, and we got on very well after a while, feeling freer uh, to express myself. I, I might have told him off a couple of times, but, <laughs> but you know, uh, I didn't grow up with that feeling because my mom never felt in that way towards mm. him. She understood him and they were young and um, and it was all a bit sudden. And so he was still studying architecture and um, so... And he kept on saying, "Oh my God, next year! Oh, when I when I have my diploma! Oh, when I when I'm working! Oh, when this you know when I grow older and I'm wiser and I've got more to offer, I'll find a way to reunite." And um, and it happened, it, but it happened um, thanks to a friend, that uh, an architect friend of my mum. Again, to make it short because it's more complicated than that, but uh, so he said, but. I think this is your, 
your dad. Why shall we? And he created the opportunity for all of us to meet again. Where was and it? It was very was, special. Was it in, it in, was in Rome. It was in Rome. It was in Rome. Yes, it was in Rome because he also had a home uh, in Rome. And uh, it was a wonderful lunch where he made an amazing uh, repas, the, um, you know, Iranian food. Uh, it was very, I was, I was enchanted. It was exactly like I had imagined, you know, all the, um, this food that it was, uh, uh, what did he make? I think he made Fesenjun. <laughs> that now Good I know very him. well is yeah, my yeah. favorite dish. Yeah. Oh, he's very, he's a very good cook. Okay. And then he also made rice with some, um, some orange and uh, something like sour, sour sweet. Delicious, delicious. And I was obviously just staring at him. I wasn't saying much. <laughs> it was all a bit overwhelming. And then from that day onwards, we, we, it was just better and better. We got to know each other and we became very close. And now he's a wonderful grand, grandfather to my child. She loves him. And she said recently, speaking of origins, you see, my, my companion, my, my life companion, Fabrice, my Fabrice, daughter, Scott, Fabrice yeah. yes, he's, uh, uh, he was born in Quebec. His uh, father is Irish and his mother is French uh, Basque. Confusing your daughter even more. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, she's, she's got very <laughs> clear ideas and she makes me laugh because obviously, so uh, she has an Iranian grandfather, uh, an Italian grandmother, and then Irish and then French. So it should be just four, right? But at some point we explained to her that the Italian, the Italian grandmother was a big mix. The, the Irish uh, grandfather was also a bit mixed with England and, uh, and other origins, Celtic and English. And then the French one was Basque and French. So she oh, said one day, she didn't even tell us. She explained all this to her uh, nursery school teacher. <laughs> and she told her at the end of the day, at the end of the day, I'm mostly Persian. Wow. <laughs> and wow. I was like, she did all their calculations and she understood that because her Iranian grandfather has, has, is Iran, has been Iranian for generations, right, his right, family, right. The pure she was mostly, yeah, yeah. yeah exactly. Do you, is it true so, that you visited Iran? Yes, I went with my dad and with my sister in... 2003 the summer of 2003 wow so what was that like for you oh that was amazing it was very special because i met gr my grandparents for the first time my uncles my aunties my cousins it was very where were they my in tehran tehran a uh, bubble star on the caspian sea the north yeah yeah that's where my grandparents were living and um and my uncles mainly my aunts and uncles mainly in tehran and i loved everything about it um to me it was also very you know very um the, let's say even though i believe in the freedom of not being veiled mm -hmm. Uh, something that my father was a bit afraid of, like you will have, it's very hot in summer and he's very sensitive about the women cause, let's say, and the freedom of, of not being veiled and, uh, not suffering that kind of heat in summer and, uh, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, I don't want to go too much into it. Maybe it's not the place, but uh, he was a bit concerned, but because for me it was just two weeks and it was a completely different, you know, place. And uh, I kind of enjoyed everything, even that. Did you have a sense of, uh, I mean, no one would blame you if you felt like an, an outsider. You were your kid that's grown up in, in Europe and uh, in, in Italy. But did you feel when you went to Iran a, a sense of belonging at all? Yes, I did. I did. did. I recognized because, because I've, I grew up my whole life with, um, I have no resemblance with my mom and my grandmother. My grandmother is tall, blue eyed, blonde. My mom is green eyed and with, uh, you know, fair hair, not blonde, but Chatin Claire. And, um, and suddenly I was surrounded by people that really, 
looked like me and eyes that that seemed very familiar to me, you know, and, and, and my family. I look like them. I can see when I see my grandmother, my Iranian grandmother, I think like I will look much more like her than my Italian, Austrian, Czechoslovakian one. Hmm. <laughs> have you, you have know? you learned to speak Farsi? Has your uh, dad encouraged you to, uh, you know, make Bagali Polo or like uh, how, I wish, how, how I deep wish. have you gone into uh, your... <laughs> I wish. that's but, but I was very, I am very happy that I insisted for him to speak Farsi with my sister. So my sister speaks very good Farsi. She's oh, wow. 19 years older, younger than me. And she, because I was there and I insisted, I said, please don't make that mistake. Please speak to her in Farsi now from when she's a kid, because that's going to be so much easier for her. I took lessons with somebody else, with my father. It was absolutely impossible. He had no patience whatsoever, <laughs> and it was too late. So I took lessons, and at some point, it was, it was, I was getting somewhere. But um, now it's, it's, uh, it's very rusty. So I wouldn't even, you know, I wouldn't even try. I can only say, oh, on. you know, Chetori, a- Chetore, <laughs> and uh, Hubi, Huba, uh, uh, Sib, I love Pom, Apple, you know, and all the other little words that kids can say, or Khudafes, uh, Salam. But I don't, um, I cannot really say full on sentences feeling comfortable with it. I feel so what's well, Certainly not too late for you to. I mean, like, no, it's not and by the way, I, I, I'm speaking be... to you as if I'm like I'm illiterate myself. I, <laughs> I, I, I can speak Farsi, but I can't read and write it very well. So, so don't feel bad. I mean, I, and I'm you know uh, both sides uh, Persian and my. I lineage, can write but... it a little bit. Funny enough, because I was very, I was so fascinated by the the difference with our writing that it seemed like beautiful drawings, and so I w- I've I learned to write the words that I can say. So those I can say, I can also write. Part of, part of, my uh, name. And <laughs> well, that's good. Part of, part of the reason I was uh, wondering if you speak Farsi is because I, um, I and I don't want to be too uh, ethnocentric here, but I mean, it, it, there is this great tradition, contemporary tradition now of, of Iranian film. Uh, there's uh, these amazing films that have been made and, and some amazing directors, as you know. And, and I yes. was wondering, and I, been thinking about you and thinking if you would want to work with a, a an Iranian director like Askar Fahadi oh, or you know uh, or if I you're, would love to work with him I appreciate him so much and I met him I met him in Paris because I'm very I'm very I'm a very good friend of uh, Babak Karimi sure, yeah. he used to be um, an editor in Italy and he's also a friend of my dad and now he lives again in Iran he lives in Tehran and he works with Achfar um, Faradi and uh, once he was in Paris and he called me and he said oh please uh, uh, come over and I'll introduce you to Achfar and so I I had a lovely evening with them and I discovered that he went to university with my uncle uh-huh. my uncle Ardeland Shojai um, who now works as an actor in Tehran, and um, and so little coincidences. It's, uh, it's I'd say you're world. I'd say you're primed to be in the in a in a in a, in a Persian film. I think this. But is, I am. Uh, we we um with a. Do you know this Bani Khoshnudi? She's a young uh, female director, oh. um, and we have a project together. Oh, fabulous! So, okay. Um, yes, hopefully in a year's time. There'll be a film where I play an Iranian woman. I, we will look forward to that. You'll have to come back mm. on the program when you do that. Maya, it is such a great pleasure to talk to you, and I'm a fan, and I'm and I'm I really Same here. Uh, think Thank it, you. it's uh, a, a joy. Uh, let me ask you a final question, and and it's yes. always interesting to talk to someone who's um, uh, not at the beginning of their journey, and certainly not at the end of their journey. Um, what what would you say you've learned today that you didn't know when you so famously broke out in the Italian film scene twenty years ago? Hmm. Wow. It's always the most difficult one, right? The closing question. Um, what have I learned that I didn't know at the time about this business? About or, yourself. Uh, oh, about myself. So many things. You wouldn't have the time to listen to them. <laughs> um, what could I say? A little... Well, maybe, funnily enough, even though it seems a bit of a clever answer, it's like that we know 
very little. <laughs> the more of it, the more you go forward, the more you move forward, the more you experience life, the more you realize you know very little yes. about it all. Yes. So I'm kind of eager to to have more experiences and to keep on learning. Uh, I think when you're young, you 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 have the presumption of knowing a lot, and when you are in your forties, you realize that yeah, you know very little, <laughs> and, and 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 it's good, and it's and it's agreeable. It's an agreeable knowledge. Don Henley famously saying, uh, "The more I the more I know, the less I understand." Uh, yeah, exactly. So, so Probably it's it's, it's that's well said. That's well said. Um, Maya yeah. Sansa, thank you so much for this today. Um, Heidi, uh, Hollywood, I, I, I enjoyed it. I, I, I thank you and um, uh, be safe and uh, greetings to your family. Oh, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. It was very agreeable. And uh, who knows, maybe one day we'll meet in a, in a, a post COVID world. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> yes. Let's hope so. We'll, we'll meet for real. Thank you. Chodafes. Chodafes. <laughs> that is acclaimed actress Maya Sansa. Her latest films are entitled You Came Back and Azuro. Maya Sansa joined us from Paris, France today. The Rook Team microphones are back on. Captain Reza Gurbishaya, the fabulous Keon. Wow, I really enjoyed talking to him. What a what a warm uh, and lovely personality. That was really really nice talking to Maya. Yes. Loved her voice. It's very oh. very soothing. Milokio, oh. I was dying. <laughs> what a fabulous voice. Yeah. Her life story can be a film <laughs> itself. No, for real. It's true. Like, it's incredible. Maybe you could make that film, That's Captain right. Reza. Mm -hmm. Starring Maya Sansa. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. <laughs> you know, it's Thursday, and you know what that means. Mm. No idea. He's the captain of cuisine, the culinary colonel, the Tabrizi talisman, the Farsi food meister, the Turkish tradesman. It's your chef, Has Zare, and this is Rook Hospitality. Hi, this is your chef, Has Zare. <laughs> This is Rock Haas Hello, Chef Haas. Hello. Uh, I, 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 judging from your social media, you're in a good place. You were happy with the uh, the inauguration yesterday. It seems you've 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 made clear your colors, your political stripes. Uh, it's the happiest moment. I mean, it's almost like you're waking up for the, from dark there to new, new bright there. It's what a difference when one country in one day, one second changes for the humanity, for better hope for future. So to be honest with you, yesterday I found myself very happy. I'm not a political person. For politics for me is food. Food brings people together. But yesterday I found myself running for 10 miles. I don't know how time passed, but I was in joy of and letting my stress out from that 10 mile run. Yeah, it was really, uh, it was inspirational that inauguration. Uh, thank you for saying all that. By the way, Keon has left the room now. She's so upset with what you just said. <laughs> but, uh, no, I, you know what? Every chance for a new day, for a new chance of uh, life again is, is good How for magnanimous, me. <laughs> I mean, very magnanimous of you. Good, good job, I like Keon. the way Chef Haas described it. All right. Right. Thank you. <laughs> Chef Haas, with all this new energy, with a new day in America and a new excitement, fresh from your 100-mile run or whatever it was you just said, <laughs> what are you going to teach us today about uh, on hospitality? Well, like we were talking about politics right now, the food brings the people and is ambassador of the culture, in my opinion. So in this situation, we can introduce our culture. We've been doing that one, Iranian food with a culture and show who's the people, who's the politics. So uh, okay. I want to today look at the Iranian cuisine through the lens of the healthy eating, plan based, plan forward. And specifically today, I want to talk about dolma. Okay. It's, uh, one of my favorite dishes. Okay, so you're going to talk about Iranian cuisine in a healthy plant forward 
plant plant based way, and yeah. specifically dolma, which uh, usually has minced meat in it. Mm-hmm. I think, right? Not always. Okay. Uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, the one uh, you talk a dolma with the meat. There's another dolma without meat in the Turkish word called yalanchi. Means fake. It means that you're lying. Oh. Uh, so yalanchi is famous. For I don't want that. I, I'm not yalanchiing you. I, I, <laughs> I'm just telling you what I know about dolma. So no, no, I didn't say that you were. But it's the name <laughs> of the dish actually, yalanchi. So uh, when we talk about dolma, you know, basically you're talking about the element of the modern nature's product, like uh, from grain, legumes, or spices, herbs. And you make it dishes, and you have two elements. One is the stuffing. One is what is stuffed in stuff, like a fruit, vegetables, or the wraps, the lettuces. So they all play their own um, uh, part in this dish. Okay. And basically, these fruit and vegetables or the wraps, it almost acts as a container to hold these flavors, but it traps the flavor inside rather than going vaporize it. So right. it's beautiful. Dish and they almost like a tango in each other because they flavor each other. Like, for example, bell pepper dolma flavors different than the yellow uh, tomatoes dolma because they infuse their flavor to their stuff. Dolma, by the way, means Turkish for means stuffing. And it's been ancient years been practiced, but it hasn't been introduced popular by uh, Ottoman uh, Turks, Ottoman, Ottoman Empire. But if you look at the history, ancient and Greek, they used to do the sweetened cheese it started with the fig in, in, in the fig leaves, and they eat it. So the history was there, but it hasn't been documented until the Ottoman Empire. Okay. So, but the, let's talk about the dolmas, how many variety, what we, we can have a, a vegetarian vegetable stuffing, we can have leaves, lettuces, we can have fruits, we can have seafood, and we can have an offal. Fruit, fruit inside fruit. the dolma. Surely that's uh, uh, no. That's it's not stuff the fruit, not other way around. It's stuffing the fruit. Oh, stuffing the fruit. Oh, sorry. Okay, okay. So these are the five different way of the yeah, backward. Like so, the vegetables, leaves, fruits, seafood, and offal are stuffed with the grain and the vegetables and whatever you like. What was the last one? Uh, offal is a basically is their internal organs. Also, uh, it, it, you get this celebration that all the religion, all the cultures, uh, the Jewish, uh, Assyrian, Iranian, Turkish, they use this one. And basically they respect gratitude to the mother nature that they give them to these ingredients. And they put in like, they call it a little jewel box. Like when you have mm-hmm. a dolma of the grape leaves, it's like the, for me it's jewel box. They have beautiful jewels inside it, play right, with it. Right. And, wow. and that comes from the earth. You respect the earth. Like in Nowruz, we have a tradition we boil dolma. We're looking for to get a better d- days in the future and more good life to come to us. By the way, she- Chef Haas, is there a difference between dolma and dolmadas? No, same. I mean, every culture has it. Everybody diff- pronounce it differently. Okay, okay. Mm. Are, are you? Uh, is, is it basically that you're saying just put plants and veggies in in the dolma instead of? Uh, I, for, you know, meat that you would uh, fry in oil or something like that? Well, you don't need a meat in a, in a which, uh, I mean, dolma, basically, in my opinion, because old days they had access, but because economically they couldn't afford to eat, meat, eat a lot of meat, so they used to do a lot of packing the vegetables and legumes and grains, and a little bit, like they had a family of 20, 30 people in one house, they couldn't have a half a pound of the meat with everybody, so they used to dice some meat or the ground some meat, put in the, this just a flavor it and a little nutritious value. But you can get it all of this from these beautiful vegetables. Mm. Okay. So do you have a specific, uh, I mean, I know we're, we're going to, um, uh, I'm excited about this. We're going to actually post a video of you, uh, I guess, with the ingredients and, and showing us how to make one of these dolmas at our website, rookmedia.com. Rookmedia.com. We're going to have uh, a video of Chef Haas doing this. But but is there a specific recipe or today, or is there a specific list of ingredients that you want to teach to us? See, that comes beautiful. Like for me, dolma is the easiest item as a chef, I can say for home cook, everybody, we call in, in, in provision, in provision or bedah pazi. Basically, if you don't cook, you can play the ingredients 
like a more example, if you don't have rice, you can put it at brown rice, you can put the chickpeas, right. gorbanzo beans, you can play everywhere in God. Actually, for hang example, on one second. Reza has a question. Okay, go ahead. So, Chef, uh, dolma is one of my favorite foods, and and I'm not a cook at all. Like, I'm not good at cooking. I'm not re- I don't really enjoy it. And I want to know how I'd be able to, if you can explain to me, not only give me the re- recipe, walk me through it, how to make it the easiest way possible and the healthiest. Absolutely. Just basically one of the leftover rice or beans you have separately, mix it together with some fresh herbs and your spices you choose, you like it. So you have a vegetarian base and then pick a, like a grape leaves or the cabbage or any uh, vegetables you want to stuff it, carve it, season it with salt and pepper, stuff it, and then in a tight pot, put it next to each other with a tiny bit you want a moisture to uh, cook in the steam. Basically, you take the water and add some spices, maybe tomato paste or some pomegranate paste if you want, and just cover it, let it cook in that own steam for 45 minutes. Should I add oil to the pot as well or no? No, you don't need because that liquid from the water and the spice and the flavor you give, it, and you cover it almost like you are steaming the vegetables mm. and trapping the flavors. In the low heat, you cook it slowly, submerging that broth, and eventually that sauce broth water is going to be reduced to the point like about half an inch at the end is going to be and then you have it and you can use it as a sauce wow that's good yeah. that's really helpful i thought it would be way more complicated than, than no, that. so that's easy so, so easy. easy and like i say uh it, 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 three factors basically mixing the ingredients you want you like don't be afraid of what you put how much you put to pick up to your favorite vegetables or fruit you want to stuff it and then a small pot, stuff it, put it there. And the third, and most important, some liquid you want to steam it, which is the could be water, could be chicken stock if you don't want to have a vegetarian, and flavor it with the spices and cover it like a rice. Let it steam for half an hour, 45 minutes. Depends on the uh, vegetables you use for outside. And after that, you're done. And you can enjoy it with the side of yogurt, uh, sumac yogurt, little citrus yogurt on top. It will be add some bread. It will be fantastic. Delicious. That sounds great. <laughs> Chef Haas, you've done it again, by which I mean confused us somewhat, <laughs> but uh, also... <laughs> Well, but I'm also, that one on the, to, clear the air with the you've also made us hungry. Let the All people this, ask the question in the future, so the, I can personally answer them. No, these are good. No, we've got we've learned a lot, and even more importantly, we've got a video coming out on rookmedia.com. Chef Haas with his ingredients, uh, showing us a little bit about how we can make these dolmas in a yeah. plant-based, plant-forward, healthy way. Yeah. Chef Haas, thank you so much. Thank you, guys. Have a wonderful day. Bye, Chef. Bye, Bye Chef. Thank Bye. you so much. Bye. That is Chef Haas Zare with Rook Hospitality. Again, to watch the video of Chef uh, showing us, uh, Chef Haas showing us how to make the dolma and, and the ingredients, go to rookmedia.com. You can find Chef Haas at Chef Haas on Instagram. And this, with that, is full time for Rook for today. Remember, for all things Rook, everything, everything you'd ever want, rookmedia.com is the website, rookmedia.com, where you can read our latest Rook read or see the video from Chef Haas Zare on how to make dolma or dolme, as we might call it, in a healthy way. Rookmedia.com, thanks to the amazing team who put this show together. Master Muhammad, Savvy Rohan, The Fabulous Keon, Thoughtful Nagin, Ponta the Artist, Producer Susan, Alhai Mehrdad, Captain Reza and Guvi Shaya. Thanks to those of you supporting us, sharing our content. Please subscribe. Find me on Instagram at Gian Gomeshi. Mizunbashi.